What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I wanna break down conical fermenters for you guys. A lot of folks are asking, why would I wanna use conical? That's a valid question. I think a lot of folks out there look at conicals and say, oh, it's just high-end home brewing equipment, but it doesn't necessarily give any advantages. And that's not necessarily true, but a lot of folks also look at conical fermenters and think, oh, this is gonna automatically make me better beer. And that is also not true. Today we're gonna find out how to use these complicated and advanced pieces of home brewing equipment to the best of their abilities. And I'm hoping that this helps you decide on whether or not you need something like this in your brew house or want something like this in your brew house. But also I'm hoping it unlocks some new potential for you guys if you already own something like this and potentially didn't know how to use certain aspects of it. So the first thing we gotta do here is actually discuss what even is a conical and what is meant by that, because a conical can actually mean a lot of things. I think a lot of folks, when they first hear that phrase, think, oh, top of the line, high-end, stainless steel, pressure-capable unitank, 2,000, 3,000, $4,000 piece of equipment. That's actually not true because most conicals actually fall within the one to $500 range. The term conical means any type of fermenter with a cylindrical upper portion and a tapered cone moving down to the bottom. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a bottom drain valve on it. However, in most cases, that is the case. So when you look at the market for conicals, there's actually items like the Anvil Crucible and the Northern Brewer Reactor Conical and the SS Brewtech Chronicle. There's also plastic options like the Firmzilla. Those all have conical designs that really do fall into the content of this video. There's a lot of different options out there that are not at crazy price points like some of the more popular ones that are out there. However, when we're talking conicals, we do have to loop in unit tanks. Those are conical fermenters capable of holding pressure. And those are things like the SS Brutec unit tank, the Spike CF series of unit tanks. The Spike Flex is technically a conical fermenter without a bottom dump valve, but it is also a unit tank. And also things like the Brewbuilt uh, X1 and X2 series of unit tanks. These are the more expensive ones that folks are much more accustomed to hearing about because they have the capacity to hold pressure. And we'll get more into why that matters later on in the video. Regardless of whether it's a plastic conical or a stainless unitank, conical fermenters are a industry standard for the most part, I would say. Whether it's a three barrel nano brew house or Anheuser-Busch making enormous batches, they are all using conical fermenters for the most part. Why is that? Well, the shape of the fermenter is really the biggest thing. It encourages things to drop out of solution faster. Also considering that they have dump ports at the very bottom for the most part, you're gonna be looking at the option to actually dump that troop out from underneath the beer without oxygen exposure. And also you're looking at the ability to collect and reuse your yeast. This is in most cases, I would say the primary reason why folks want to use conical fermenters on the professional side. You get consistency, you get the ability to save tons of money on yeast, and eventually I think there's a return for your investment on that, although at the homebrew scale, that's generally not the case. There's usually a lot of ports on the cone or the bottom of the cylindrical portion of the conicals. This gives you options to do things like oxygenate your wort directly from the side of the tank, or actually add in CO2 to the whole thing and rouse your yeast if you're doing a high gravity fermentation or you need to rouse your yeast to encourage things to move along things like that. And also these conicals really do have just a ton of advanced features for the most part. You have lots of ports, lots of different options to hook different stuff up. Depending on the conical, you might be able to pressure ferment this way. You might be able to use a spunding valve this way. You can hook up sample ports to take oxygen-free samples of your worts. You can hook up sight glasses so that you can see how the fermentation is progressing. You can see the clarity, the color of your beer, what kind of sedimentation levels you're looking at. You can use thermo wells, which will give you the option to measure the temperature of your wort exactly as it is inside the fermenter, and then control that through advanced cooling and heating possibilities. Most conicals nowadays have the option to be uh, heated with a heating pad around the cone or cooled off with a cooling coil or a jacket. This allows you to fine tune the temperature of your fermentation regardless of what kind of environment it is in. And that is a big deal. More often than not, if you have a conical fermenter, you have the capacity to pressure transfer to close transfer your beer into a keg and package it that way. In some cases, you can fully carbonate your beer in the fermenter before packaging it as well, and then do all of that oxygen free, which enables you to have much higher shelf stability in general and just better consistency all around. 
And those are all reasons why the pros use them. And I think most of those are also reasons why home brewers might be interested in them. At the end of the day though, I'd say maybe like seven out of 10 home brewers who use conicals are primarily just using them for either the yeast harvesting capacity so they can reuse yeast or they're using them to pressure transfer or they're just using them for consistency and convenience. So now let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. How do you use a conical? Okay, you just bought a unit tank. What happens now? The first thing you need to do when you get your conical assembled is clean and passivate it. Um, you don't need to passivate it if it's just a regular old plastic from Zilla or something like that, but if you have a stainless steel conical, you do need to passivate. First, you need to clean it with PBW, which is gonna get the factory oils off of the stainless steel. Uh, trust me, you want to get rid of those before you ferment with it, otherwise your beer will taste kind of funny. Ask me how I know. And then the passivation part is an interesting thing. So you'll have to do this every so often, roughly every six months. Um, or if you don't use your conical very frequently, you might want to do it a little bit more often. Passivation is a strong acid rinse, essentially. For the homebrew scale, star sand is generally going to do the job. If you make a star sand solution with a concentration of one ounce per gallon, this is much stronger than your typical one ounce per five gallons rate. Soak the insides of the fermenter in that, soak the steel parts in that for about 30 minutes, and then drain it all out and allow it to air dry. This is a very important part. Air drying completes the passivation process. What's gonna happen is the acid and the steel are gonna interact, and then when it air dries, there's a very thin protective layer that is going to form on the steel that's gonna protect the stainless steel from oxidizing or rusting. Even 304 stainless steel is capable of rusting if you don't passivate it and you don't take care of it. So that's a very important first step. The next thing to discuss here is how to clean and how to sanitize these fermenters. Generally, non-jacketed, non-pressure capable conicals aren't too particularly heavy. So if you have something like the Anvil Crucible, it shouldn't be hard to move that around, clean it and wash it just like any other fermenter. However, if you have a unit tank, those can get heavy. And um, I have a Spike CF5 and a Brewbilt X2. Both of these are upwards of 50 pounds unloaded. So when it comes down to cleaning them, I don't wanna move them around very much. And I used to really hate that. I used to actually take my Spike CF5 all the way up two flights of stairs, cause I don't have a sink down here. And I would clean it out in the sink upstairs sanitize it up there, bring it all the way back down, and I have to do this many times, and it got really old really fast. This went on for a while until somebody reminded me that I could CIP this thing, and I'm like, of course I could CIP this thing. How did I never think about that? CIP is really a lifesaver for conicals, and it's actually the professional brewery's method of cleaning. CIP means clean in place, and it's a relatively simple procedure. You're gonna want a couple pieces of equipment for this. You're gonna want a CIP ball, which is a spray ball essentially, um, and I'll link a good one in the description, and you're gonna want a pump. And generally, the more powerful the pump, the better. So I do recommend going all the way up and getting a Blickman Riptide if you can. It's a great brewery pump and it works not just for CIP, but works for everything in the brewery. Um, but the pump is a big deal. You wanna have a lot of pressure on that CIP ball. Beyond that, you just need some tubing and some disconnects and you're good to go. So a CIP process starts as soon as you've kegged your beer. So you have a fermenter that's empty, but it's full of fermentation gunk and uh, just a bunch of crap, right? So the first thing you wanna do is get about three gallons of good, powerful uh, PBW solution. Having a lower amount of uh, actual liquid in the fermenter is actually a good thing for CIP. So even if you have like a 14 or a 20 gallon fermenter, you really only need enough liquid to really just get up to about the end of the cone. You're gonna circulate that PBW solution out the very bottom drain port with all your stuff attached to the fermenter through the pump and back up through the lid through the CIP ball. You're gonna do that for about 30 minutes. This is going to really just break down all the crud, get it off of there. Um, off of the side of the fermenter, clean out from some of the cavities. It's gonna get 90% of the gunk out of your fermenter. Drain that out, discard it, and do a water rinse to get the PBW residue off. With the water rinse, again, you're gonna wanna run that for about 15 minutes or so. Once you have all of the gunk off of the fermenter and off of the inside, do a visual inspection, make sure it looks good, and then take all of the individual parts off the fermenter and clean those by soaking them in some PBW and rinsing them as you would anything else. 
reattach them, and then you are good to go. It is that easy. You never have to pick the fermenter up. You never have to take it anywhere. 90% of the process is just waiting for the CIP cycle to finish. It's really pretty easy. And that's actually the same process, just in reverse for sanitation. Now, one big note for sanitation in place, if you're gonna do the same process, get a non-foaming sanitizer. If you're using star sand with a CIP ball, it's gonna have the same effect as putting dish soap in the dishwasher. You're gonna have just an absolute mountain of bubbles. You're gonna cavitate your pump and probably ruin it. So you don't wanna do that. That means this right here, Sani Clean by Five Star, the same company that makes star sand. This is a non-foaming sanitizer. It's a little weaker than star sand, so you need to ensure contact time of about three minutes to really ensure sanitation. This is one ounce of this for three gallons of water, and it's pretty much the same process as the CIP with PBW, just in reverse. I recommend taking all your parts off the fermenter first and soaking them in the Sandy Clean solution for a bit, reattach them, and then run the Sandy Clean through the spray ball for about 20 minutes or so, then dump it all out, and you should be sanitized and ready to receive any sort of wort that goes in that fermenter. Conical fermenters most of the time have an option to either cool or heat your fermentation up uh, in the fermenter itself. And I really recommend taking advantage of these. Nothing beats not having to put your fermenter in a fermentation chamber or otherwise try to finagle some way to actually heat or cool it. Most of the times there's heating pads you can buy that will wrap around the cone portion of the fermenter. And they're usually like around 60 to 120 watts, which is not really all that much. But when you have them in an insulated environment and you turn them on for a long time, they will heat your fermentation up very effectively. And they're really good tools. And for the cooling side, cooling coils and glycol jackets exist, and those are awesome if they do come with your fermenter and you have the ability to use them. Now, you can always go the glycol chiller route. Uh, the cheapest glycol chiller I know of is about 600 bucks, and that's the Brewbuilt Ice Master Max 2. However, you can also do the exact same thing with a mini fridge and a bucket of ice water or a bucket, even better, of glycol water mixture. Glycol itself is not expensive. Uh, so if you do a 20% glycol water solution in a mini fridge, put an aquarium pump in there, and then run that out through into your fermenter uh, via cooling coil or jacket, you're gonna have really good cooling performance and you're gonna save yourself about $400 by doing that. So that's the method that I recommend. Overall though, you're gonna definitely wanna get an Inkbird heating and cooling controller, um, just a, an on a simple on-off controller, but it will manage your fermentation very well. They're extremely accurate temperature sensors, which is really nice and they're super cheap. This is the best way to make sure that you don't have to worry about hot versus cold. And sometimes they connect to Wi-Fi too, which is great because then you can monitor your fermentation without ever being near it. Really handy tools. If you have a conical fermenter that is capable of doing pressure fermentation, uh, meaning that it can hold up to around 15 PSI, I highly recommend a few things for your fermentation. The first is some kind of spunding valve combination. Some companies that make high-end fermenters will try to sell you um, very expensive pressure fermentation kits. Oftentimes you do not need these things. If your fermenter has a tri-clamp port in the lid, the only thing you really need to buy is a one and a half inch tri-clamp with a gas port and a PRV valve. Add to that combination a spunding valve, which is not an expensive thing at all. Don't buy the really expensive ones, just buy the cheaper ones. Get a blow tie from Kegland. It'll do the same thing that a $300 pro spunding valve will do. Put those things together and you have the ability to regulate your pressure. If you want to pressure ferment, set your spunding valve to maintain 15 PSI and pop that bad boy on before fermentation is complete. The natural CO2 from fermentation will build up and will allow you to maintain that 15 PSI. Same thing is true of spunding at the end of fermentation if you want to do that for a traditional lager, nothing wrong with that. When it comes to pressure transfers, again, that inch and a half tri-clamp uh, attachment I just mentioned will do all that you need to put a gas line on that port and then transfer your beer with an inch and a half tri-clamp to keg disconnect uh, attachment on your main racking arm and you'll get the job done without any issues. One of the main questions that a lot of people ask me too on this is when do you dump trube? When do you harvest yeast? And that's a good question because that definitely varies depending on the type of beer you're making. Now most of the time you would dump your trube out after it has settled out after the first day or two of fermentation. And then dumping your yeast is a different thing. You'll wanna do that generally after fermentation's finished or if you do a cold crash of some kind, uh, that's generally a better way to dump your yeast because it'll be much more compressed and you'll be able to gauge when to stop a lot easier. Now, 
you don't need to do this. Um, you don't need to dump your trube. You don't need to dump your yeast if you don't want to. It doesn't really have an impact on the final beer, whether you choose to or not. But if you are harvesting your yeast, it does make sense to dump the trube first and just to get fresh yeast into however you're uh, gonna be collecting it. So that's generally the way that I would recommend doing things. Um, if you are dry hopping into your fermentation and you want to avoid hop creep, dumping your yeast is a really good idea. So that's another situation in which I would think about doing that. Generally, conicals have a few more things going for them than other fermenters when it comes to oxygen resistance. And oxygen really is one of the primary enemies of most beer, especially hazy IPAs like this one. So when it comes down to actually dry hopping your beer, um, conicals do have a lot of options to do so. I've covered a few of these in an old video that I'm going to link up here in the corner for the sake of time. Um, but one of the easiest things you can do with a conical is simply hook a CO2 line up to one of your bottom ports, bubble CO2 up through your beer, and then you could take the lid plain off of the conical. There's absolutely no reason why that's an issue because CO2 is pushing up outside um, from the bottom up, is pushing all oxygen out of the beer. You can straight up dump your hops in, put your lid back on, and call it a day. That's one of the best ways to dry hop with a conical. Now you can also use a device known as a hop dropper to purge uh, the actual hops themselves before putting them into the beer via a uh, kind of like almost a pressure chamber. Um, and that's another option. I mean, there's plenty of options with conicals when it comes to dry hopping. They're really versatile tools. Um, and I think that's one of the main draws for a lot of folks nowadays because hey, a lot of folks do want to brew these hazy oxygen sensitive IPAs. So there's a couple accessories I would recommend if you're buying a conical that uses inch and a half tri-clamp ports. The first one, especially if you're using either a spike conical or a brew built conical, is a two inch to one and a half inch tri-clamp reducer. Uh, these fermenters use two inch dump valves and for the most part that means that all you're doing is getting a bunch of two inch accessories and that's kind of a waste of money when you can just get an adapter that brings your two inch accessories down to a one and a half inch just like the rest of every other tri-clamp thing out there. So that's one recommendation. Secondly, get a sight glass uh, and put it on your bottom port. A sight glass is gonna be very important for not only gauging that fermentation is happening, but also for looking at uh, how the beer is gonna look, looking at the clarity, if that's what you're after, looking at fermentation activity, gauging when it's done, because you'll see the yeast drop down to the bottom of the sight glass, but also when you're dumping trube, when you're dumping yeast, that sight glass is gonna help you know when to turn off that bottom valve and save beer. The same thing is true when you're transferring your beer, you'll know when it's done just by looking at that sight glass. It's a very convenient thing. Thirdly, I'd recommend getting this sample valve. Um, the default sample valves that typically come with these kits, they're like knob style sample valves and they work fine, but the issue is that the way the valve is designed is very kind of frustrating. Basically, you'll turn, 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 and then all of a sudden you'll get a gushing fountain of beer coming out of your sample valve, and then you'll turn it off and turn, 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 and eventually it'll turn itself off. Um, and it's frustrating because generally they get sticky, um, they have a tendency to clog, and I don't like them. I do recommend replacing it with this sample valve because this sample valve is just a simple on-off ball valve and that is so much easier. It's also more sanitary and just simply a better design. I recommend getting a decarbonation coil as well, which you can add to this. When you're taking a gravity sample, carbonation in the sample is gonna throw off the reading, so you wanna make sure you get all the carbonation out, and this little coil allows all the CO2 to express itself out of the actual beer when you're taking the sample before it even gets to your glass. Very highly recommend that. It's also always a good idea to buy more tri-clamp gaskets and clamps than you think you need because you will lose these things and they just are hard to keep track of sometimes and also a couple additional inch and a half tri-clamp accessories i do recommend a inch and a half tri-clamp to quick disconnect so you can hook up your hoses to them very easily if you don't use quick disconnects then ignore that and just get a hose barb one um, and also an inch and a half tri-clamp to keg post disconnect so that you can actually do a uh, close transfer very easily. It's also useful to put ball valves or butterfly valves on almost every port, uh, just so you have the ability to turn those off and on as you need to. You can hook things up and open the flow and then close the flow and take those things off without spilling beer everywhere. Uh, it's a very useful item. So I hope that's helpful in terms of giving you guys ideas on how to better utilize your conical fermenters. At the end of the day, do they make better beer for you? 
No, they don't. I've said this a million times and I will continue to say it a million times. You will make better beer in a bucket with good skills than you will with a conical and not much skill. These really are advanced pieces of homebrewing equipment. If you're just starting out, if you're just getting into this hobby, please, I beg you, resist the urge to buy expensive equipment. I recommend learning the basics on mid-range equipment. Don't go with super low-end equipment, go with mid-range equipment. And that way, if you find that you don't like this hobby, you're not out thousands of dollars in the process. I think 99% of what you need for successful fermentation and for generally just a painless fermentation uh, and a painless transfer process, you can get out of a stainless steel bucket fermenter. I really love the Anvil bucket fermenters. I've used them for years and they have never let me down. And honestly, I still like to use them every so often too, even though I own two conical fermenters. So there's no reason to say that one of these is superior to the other, unless you're really taking full advantage of all of those features. And if you are, you're looking for consistency, you're looking for yeast harvesting, you're looking for these particular one or two percent of things that is going to make you use your fermenter to the fullest of its capacity which is not necessarily going to make you better beer but it's going to give you consistency and it's going to help eliminate variables for you eliminating variables that can potentially ruin your beer or otherwise degrade its quality that requires know-how that requires skill and knowledge and that's why these things don't make better beer for you you as a brewer need to build that skill and build that understanding before you can really leverage these items and then make the best possible beer using them. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. There's a lot of very shiny stuff out there. Um, and I'm hoping that this helps give you guys a little bit better understanding why they exist and how to use them to the best of their potential abilities. Let me know what you think about the video and I hope you learned something. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, please go ahead, hit the like button and subscribe as well if you haven't already. And let me know down in the comment section what you think about this whole process. If you wanna support the channel, please consider checking out the merchandise store. Uh, you can get plenty of t-shirts. This is not mine, this is Party Time Brewing's t-shirt. Go check out his Teespring store if you want this one it's a great t-shirt i highly recommend it but also if you're considering supporting my channel there's also a patreon my patreon supporters have been extremely helpful in keeping this channel moving they've been extremely helpful in increasing the production quality for the channel as well if you want to support in other ways there's also the super thanks button there's the channel memberships option all of those things help me a lot i have an amazon store where you can find all of the equipment that i use to brew that's on amazon so check it out uh, if you're curious about some things there's also some youtube gear in there as well I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook if you're curious about additional content and you'll catch some early ideas of what's going to be coming to the channel in the future on those pages so check it out. Anyway guys if you're still here I really appreciate you watching all the way to the end and I hope that means that you did find this video useful. If so let me know and I'll catch you guys in the next one. This one goes out to you so until then cheers.